Chris Morgan, Senior Pastor, Christ, United, Christ Church, United Methodist in Bethel Park. How are you this afternoon? I'm doing really well, Rabbi Aaron. It's uh, great uh, to be with you th this afternoon and to be able to do something together uh, during this time. I wish we could be doing it in person. Um, I'm sure everybody is at that stage at this point in time, but uh, even though we can't be physically in person, we're, it's great to be able to connect virtually as well. So uh, thanks for the invitation and um, look forward to maybe doing this on a regular basis moving forward. I agree. You know, it is a interfaith relationships are always important in this world. It's a little more difficult when, as you say, we can't be together, but no, we're finding new ways and getting creative, which I guess is our topic of conversation. Sure. Before we dive in, are you are you in the church right now? Are you in your home office? I'm actually in the church office. Um, we are um, we have a few people that come in and out. Thursday is actually the day we do a lot of our videoing for our weekend worship services. So Thursday is probably the busiest day uh, during this particular time. Um, but uh, so we kind of go from morning till evening just because of everything that has to go on. Um, but uh, just finished shooting the sermon for this weekend uh, for for Pentecost and 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 those kinds of things. So that's in the can, as they say, and in the hands of my uh, tech folks to make it look as good as they possibly can um, with what they're working with. So, um, <laughs> but it's fun to at least be connected on some level at least once a week with folks. So. That's right. That's right. I snuck you, into the you at home or you at I snuck into the office, but you remind me of a really good, really good, very quick story that when I was a young person and we would be at my grandparents' house and they didn't have a dishwasher, so we're washing and drying the dishes. And my aunt taught me that a good dryer gets what a bad washer misses. And I think the same is true for video editing, right? A good editor can clean up a lot of our slack. Luckily, I have a good editor. <laughs> I need your person. <laughs> ah, so let's dive on in. You know, you and I have been talking a little bit about some of the denominational or some of the interdenominational differences around how our faith traditions can accommodate this new virtual world. Um, from Jewish tradition, right? My Orthodox co-religionists simply won't touch technology on Shabbat. My conservative friends um, have embraced live streaming of services with a hands-off policy that there is a fear that if you induce people to click, next thing you know, they'll be out online shopping and spending money as a transgression of the Sabbath. The reform movement, the liberal lefties of the Jewish world where I am situated, um, have a much more fluid take where each congregation gets to determine the best way to hold a community together. And for us, that has really meant moving a lot of our worship online. What are you seeing from your Methodist governing body? I know you mentioned that each bishop also has some discretion. Tell me a little bit more about the polity and how things work. So for us, we were um, lucky enough to be in the online world a little bit before this all happened. Um, we were doing some live streaming for our worship services, um, and occasionally we would do some Facebook live stuff, um, not on a regular basis, but every once in a while. So we had our, uh, our toe in the water, uh, so to speak, um, in the online world, but by no means was it at the level that it needed to be at if that was the only uh, option. So when this all happened, we kind of got together as quickly as we could to figure out what we needed to do to do this at the level to try to provide an opportunity for people to continue to connect um, in worship without being able to physically come to worship. Uh, overall, I would say everybody has kind of um, embraced the online worship experiences. We offer we offer um, different kinds of worship services. We have a Saturday night service normally, um, which I would say is kind of a traditional service light. I, I, you've been there. Um, lots of music, kind of informal. Um, and it, it's a wonderful service, a great group of people. Um, we've kind of invited them to just come to Sunday mornings or watch, watch the, the recording whenever they'd like to at this point in time. And then we were running uh, four services on a Sunday morning, contemporary and traditional, both at 9 and 11. Um, we've pared that down to one contemporary, one traditional. Um, in our 
uh, terminology. I don't necessarily like the word contemporary in general to describe a worship service because I think we should always be contemporary in our style. But that's the word we have, and it basically means more um, more rock music, for lack of a better way to put it, um, as opposed to organ, little less liturgy, those kinds of things. Um, we've gotten really good feedback on the online worship experience. Um, as I mentioned when you introduced me, Thursday is the day we kind of video. So we set our stuff to premiere on Sunday mornings at 9 and at 11. Uh, before the pandemic, we actually were doing it live. We do not do it live. And the reason we don't do it live is primarily because technology has the tendency to shut down, especially on Sunday morning. Uh, the bandwidth isn't big enough to handle all the different churches that are trying to do it. So when we premiere a video that's previously recorded, if you get that buffering circle, <laughs> um, it will start you back up where it started. Whereas if we were doing live, you could miss a big section of the service. So that's why we decided to kind of do it the way we're doing it. Um, we, we do ours primarily on Facebook. We show it on Facebook Live and we show it on YouTube. And we have the ability to, to provide a, a chat alongside it. So we try to do a little bit of interaction with the folks. So um, as pastors, we are on there, our worship leaders are on there, our staff is on there. So as we are worshiping together, um, even though we're apart, we're able to interact with each other a little bit on online. Um, really, the only complaint I've heard is one I would echo with everybody, and that is we miss being in person and we miss being together. And and uh, like I said, I would echo that. Um, I'd love to be around our folks, and um, this is definitely a new way to do it. Um, and we're doing what we can to try to make it as interactive as possible um, and to make people feel like they're part of the worship experience as much as possible. Um, there are things that in our particular area we cannot do. Um, you had mentioned that when we had talked, there were some things that um, people are doing differently. In the Methodist church, um, Methodist church in general has had some pretty pretty good leniency on what it can and can't do. People do things differently in different places. In our particular um, jurisdiction, they have decided that they do not want us to do communion virtually. Uh, they don't want us to have everybody kind of do communion where they are. Um, they'd rather us hold and do communion once we're able to come back and be in person. There are other parts of the Methodist Church, even in North America, that are doing communion virtually. Um, but we respect what our bishop feels on this. We respect what our Council of Bishop feels on this in the Northeast jurisdiction. Um, so we're not going to do communion um, virtually. Um, we have something called a love feast that is kind of like that. We have not done that yet. If this continues to go for an extended period of time, we may look into that. But at this point, we've not done that. But most of the other parts of our worship service, we can try to incorporate in an online virtual kind of a way. Um, we don't have um, really a lot of parameters around anything other than communion and, and baptisms. Obviously, we're not doing baptisms virtually. We are waiting for that um, to do as well. In our own setting, and, and I don't think there's anything that has come down from above on how to do this one way or another, but in our own setting, we would have been having our confirmation uh, be confirmed this weekend in, at Pentecost. That's part of what we do. We've decided to not do that um, this weekend because we can't be in person and we want the kids to really experience being confirmed in a congregation. So we haven't picked a new date yet, but that will be coming down the road when we can confirm them in person. We could do it online. There's nothing against it. Um, we've just made the decision to not do it online. Um, so, but other than that, everything is pretty much being able to be done virtually. Um, and now we're just trying to figure out when and how and the best way to come back and what that will look like in a church our size, um, even as we go through the red, yellow, green phases of <laughs> the state, uh, you know, how about you? Is there you know, can and can't do or? 
a lot of what you have said resonates with exactly what's happening here. Confirmation for us, we stole that one from you guys a uh, hundred or so years ago, um, was scheduled for this weekend. We too have made the decision to postpone. We're debating whether that's going to be a fall ceremony or whether we simply wait until next year at this time. Something we do for our 10th graders. So God willing, if nobody moves or has other challenges, then to get them as 11th graders in person seems better than as 10th graders virtually. I don't know, it's, it's interesting to think about some of the different challenges things we can and can't do, right? Um, in Jewish tradition, there's this concept of a minion or a quorum of 10 that is required for some of the prayers. And we're really struggling with that, right? Some, some say you, that doesn't count virtually. And so we see kind of these pop-up, socially distanced, outdoor 10 people mumbling in a park as a way of building that quorum. Others say, well, wait, 10 people in an interactive Zoom session like we're on now, as long as I can say something and you can respond to it, if I can say a prayer and you can say amen, then that should count. And others say, well, as long as that little eye icon has more than 10 cameras directed on it, we are good to go. We've got that quorum. But it's an interesting consideration. What are those kind of handcuffs that we bring to the table? You, meant, you mentioned a few, communion and baptism that are simply waiting. But I also had a chance to, as you say, be at one of your Saturday night services. And music is so central to what you guys do. How are you making that work in the virtual space? So that's kind of unique. Um, again, with us having the two different styles, um, the contemporary style kind of lends itself a little easier um, to the virtual uh, uh, platform. Uh, the traditional style is we're, we're, we're getting there and we're making it work to some degree, but it, it's just a little bit different. Um, it's a little bit more difficult because the way the way an organ works, for example, in a sanctuary, it, it makes its own sound, you know, through the pipes and through all those things. So to try to record that at a, at a good level and make that feel the same virtually is different than recording drums and guitars and keyboards that are all plugged in individually, and you can control the sound very easily. So it's just a little bit of a different way to do it. We have some awesome choirs here at the church um, and and we can't bring them in uh, to sing as a choir. We're able to bring in, you know, three, four, five people and spread them out and they can lead the singing um, for people, uh, but it, it's not the same as having a choir. We have, we have cheated a little bit because we've been in this world a little bit. We have recordings from previous services from previous years and uh, a couple of times we pull out a, a good anthem from our adult choir or from our youth choir and we add that to the service and of course put on there previously recorded so they know it wasn't done during the pandemic um, but that adds a little bit we have some wonderful musicians that have been willing to come in and share their gifts uh, to be recorded um, for like piano and flute combination um, duets and for uh, soloists to sing, and we encourage people to sing with us at home. Um, you know, it may feel weird sitting at your kitchen table or sitting in your living room or, or, or whatever else, but we really try to encourage people to, to sing with us. Uh, we still go through the process that we use. Um, we try to let our musicians know what we're preaching on in advance, so when they're picking music, it can tie in if it's possible, so we still do that. So when, when people are worshiping and then they hear the sermon, it, it hopefully on some level connects, um, you know, to those kinds of things. We still do some of the liturgy. Um, it is interesting when you're recording liturgy, for example, like a call to worship where the leader says something and then the people respond and you're recording it and then you speak as the leader and you try to like change your voice or your cadence to be the people as you respond. It's, 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 it's fun to try to get used to how that works. Um, preaching, for example, um, we've been doing a lot of tag team preaching uh, in our setting. So um, the interesting thing here in the Methodist church, I don't know exactly how it works in, in the Jewish faith, but um, we are appointed 
one year at a time by our bishop and by our cabinet. Um, and our associate pastor was just moved. Um, so his last day here was on the 26th of May. And our new pastor's first day here was on the 26th of May. Um, so for the last eight weeks or so, Pastor Seth and I had been doing tag team sermons, like kind of conversational back and forth um, kind of a thing. Uh, a couple weeks ago, he preached by himself as one of his last sermons, you know, to kind of share things with the church and those kinds of things. And now Pastor Diane is here. This is her first week. So this week I'm doing a solo sermon because she's just kind of figuring everything out. I, I hope people can imagine how difficult it is for pastors to transition when they can't be with people in person. So we're trying to let her get her feet wet that way so she can meet people that way. And then we'll start preaching the same kind of way as well. So that's a new way of doing it. Um, we've added like attendance buttons to our website and, and prayer buttons so people can fill out prayer requests. And, you know, when this all started, I kind of thought we might um, lose some of our prayer requests that we were getting because we always do like a green prayer card that people can fill out. We get stacks of them every week for our, our prayer team to pray on. Um, what I found is virtually people are actually willing to almost share more uh, concerns in prayer. I don't know it's, if it's because they're not in the room or if it's because they just feel more comfortable, but but we have experienced really good um, response to our prayer button and good response to our attendance button, which for us helps us to know that people are actually engaging. It's one thing to watch the number of uh, people watching on Facebook, but when they leave Facebook and take that next step, then you know they're really engaging. So we're really trying to focus on engagements and then also trying to reach out to folks that don't have access to technology, which we have some that just don't. So how do you do that? So that's kind of where we are from a from a music and from a worship perspective, but yeah. I get, I'm getting good feedback from. Yeah, it sounds awesome. You know, I love, I look forward to the time. We hadn't been recording or streaming prior to this. I look forward to getting far enough in that I can start reusing some of the amazing materials that we've put together <laughs> sure. after a few weeks have passed. You know, one of the blessings in all of this has been finding musical members of the congregation who maybe haven't been given that opportunity to let their voice shine until this moment. And they've really stepped forward and created some really neat, you know, I got to bring in a pro video editor to compile one where everybody is singing together one of these bigger pieces where you see all of the different voices combined and showed me what was possible. And again, all credit goes to those who can do video editing because man, they're good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're hoping to be able to do that in our traditional service, to be able to do one of those quote unquote virtual choirs where everybody kind of records on their own phone and sends it to us and then we can put it all up and see everybody on the screen. And I know you and I have actually even talked about our two congregations doing a piece that could be shown in both services. Um, so hopefully we can get that that done and, and, and out there too, just so people feel we're trying to do things that help them feel like they're connected even though they're physically not able to be in the building, you know. Yeah, that's absolutely right. You know, my heart, my heart goes out to your congregation and to your new pastor. Um, what a doozy of a time to be learning, meeting a new community when you can't be together. I'm, I'm, she is in a good place, and she is fortunate to have such a team around her. Uh, but I look forward to when we can all be back in person and the community can really embrace her and get to know her. Yeah, yeah it's. It, it, you know, I'd be interested, you know, one of the things that I've seen that it probably the most difficult thing to do during this time is, is pastoral care um, in the sense of being with people when one of their loved ones is, is sick or in the hospital or, um, you know, I spent some time last week with a family who had a, one of their loved ones and it was in a car accident. No one was allowed in. So we're sitting in the parking lot waiting for updates from the social worker. And, and you can connect in pastoral care via the phone. You can connect in pastoral care via an email. Um, I was physically in person with them in the parking lot, practicing, you know, the social distancing and all those kinds of things. But it's hard to, to, to what do you say to a family who isn't allowed to go in and see their loved one? Um, and that's happening across the board, no matter what denomination you're from, no matter what church you go to, um, 
you know, so this is definitely a unique time for us um, as leaders and as just people who care for people, how, how, to, how to do that in this time that we're living in, you know. That's absolutely right. You know, it, it became very real for me in the last few days that a, an ailing congregant at the best possible hospital to treat the condition, um, when things are going well and FaceTime or Skype or Zoom or Google Meet or telephone can keep you connected, um, but after intubation, all of those all of those points of connectivity go out the window, and that's when you simply want to be there holding someone's hand. And for a family who can't do that, for a clergy who can't do that, it's a heartbreaking time. Mm -hmm. Just adds more to the prayer list. <laughs> I mean, I think sometimes we think about prayer as a last resort, and this is teaching us that I think prayer is the first resort. Um, during these times as we try to minister and care for our congregation and whoever comes our direction. That's exactly right. So tell me something good. I don't, I don't want to try to completely make lemonade because there's still so much, so many casualties, so many cases in the country, it wouldn't be fair to those who are suffering. And yet, what are those lighter spots, those silver linings where you can, where you can begin to find them? Is there anything, anything going, going particularly well right now that you might want to continue when all is said and done? Well, sure. I, I, in our case, like I said, we had kind of put our toe in the water of the online world um, before the pandemic started. Uh, we were doing a little bit of live streaming. What we have found with our online presence now and, the, and some of the stuff we have done, we're reaching a lot of people that we weren't reaching before. Um, we've actually been able to reach people that might not ever come in the doors of the church. And, and there's lots of people writing about this kind of thing now. I, I read, I read a, a blog the other week that was interesting to me is the church becoming the mall in the world of Amazon. Um, and it stopped to make me, make me think a little bit about that, where we're just waiting for people to come to us as opposed to going to them. Um, but I don't think it's an either or. So what, what we're learning is when we are able to come back, we're definitely coming back because everybody wants those relationships, wants that physical presence. And we're definitely going to do that. But I don't think we're going to do that and stop what we're doing online. I think it is... Is, needs to become a both and. And again, looking at the re real world, so to speak, um, you see that with the stores that are closing, you know, the Pennies, the Sears, the Kmarts, those stores that didn't have an online presence, they're going bankrupt and shutting down. And stores like Walmart and Amazon and those kinds of things, Amazon's even starting to have physical stores to go with their online presence. Walmart has both. You know, I'm not pushing any particular store, but the concept is they're doing both. And as a church, I think we're going to try to keep our online presence at the level that it is um, because we're reaching people that we were never reaching when we were just a building. Um, we were a physical plant that kind of had an online presence. And I think we're going to kind of become an online presence that has a physical plant, sort of, um, so we can continue to reach as many people as we can and share with them the love of God. I mean, that's what we're trying to do. So the silver lining is the number of people that we're able to reach that we would have never been able to reach prior to this. Absolutely, you know, and the same is certainly true for us and whether it's folks who are geographically distant, whether you're a snowbird in Florida or you used to be very active in the congregation but work moved you elsewhere, now tuning into this community is still your spiritual home. It's a blessing to have all of those people tuned in. Um, and yet, I, I completely agree with everything you say, and it also puts a little bit of fear into my heart that as we're headed into a really challenging economic time, um, I worry for nonprofits and churches and synagogues. Um, you're right, we do need to keep doing all of the best of what we're doing online while we go back to doing everything we were doing in person. And we need to do that with a Maybe if we're fortunate, the same staff, most likely with a reduced staff based on our ability to remunerate them commensurate with their skills. Uh, 
there's going to be a breaking point there. And to find that balance is going to require a lot of, a lot of good humor from our congregants and parishioners in the short term. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, we were going through a process of trying to figure out, we, we've been a pretty program-driven church in general. We have lots of things going all the time. So prior to this happening, we had, we had stuff going on in our church seven days a week, pretty much all day. Um, and we were looking at, is that really healthy <laughs> to, to offer so many options, you know? Um, and we were trying to determine what we could do to help people get on a discipleship pathway and grow in their faith with God, as opposed to just plug into a program that may or may not do that. Um, and we were trying to figure all that out. And then this hit. And we jokingly said that everything we're thinking about potentially pruning, we stopped literally overnight and we brought back what was most important first, which was worship. And then we added in something for our kids and something for our youth. And then we added in our small groups and Bible studies online. And we're going to be pretty careful about what we add in beyond that, um, because those things are helping people grow as disciples. Um, and the one thing that never stopped was our missions and outreach. So now it's just a matter of making people know what mission, what's going on in missions and outreach. It never stopped. Um, so that's a big part of what we do too. Um, so we're, 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 we're going to be kind of slow in adding all the programs back because we want to be able to focus on the ones that are actually helping people grow and helping share the love of God with as many people as possible and help as many people as possible. Um, we're in a position financially that's pretty good right now. Our people are giving, and um, which is another way that we know that they're engaging because giving is continuing. Um, um, wait, I'm not entirely sure I heard you, and I want to make sure that my Temple Emmanuel members can hear that one more time. You said that a way to show that you're engaging is by financially contributing. What was that? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a way to definitely know people are engaging. Um, and in our case, we've been blessed that people are still engaging that way. Um, so um, you're welcome for that. But uh, yeah, hopefully that hopefully that's happening, not just here, but in other places as well. So we may be reconfiguring what some of our staff does um, just because we're doing other things, you know, not total overhaul, but Again, we, we are putting more time and effort into our online platform. And you said, you know, you were worried a little bit from the financial end doing both, although you think you need to do both. For, for me, I'm thinking, I know how much time I'm spending going online. When we go back to live, how's that fit into the, <laughs> the time that the staff is spending making all this happen? Which is, again, why we might not bring back all the programs because we got to buy that time somewhere. Um, but if we put our focus on where it should be, which is helping people grow as disciples, um, ironically, this week we're celebrating Pentecost. And when you look at the what we would call the birthday of the church, um, they didn't have a lot of programs. They just kind of met together in community and shared with each other care and love and sharing possessions and sharing God's grace. And that's not a bad way to go as we continue to go forward with this. So we don't have all the answers, but that's kind of what we're looking at. You're absolutely right, you know, and it, it really puts a fine point on the need to stick to mission and vision and to reinvest in those things that we should be doing and to grow a little wary of maybe some of those things that have crept in and may be absolutely wonderful and engaging and not core to who we are letting someone else who does it even better take care of that so that we can focus on what we what our bread and butter is absolutely yeah chris morgan i'm so grateful for your time today to be able to compare notes to see to see what's going on and i look forward to future opportunities to partner together well thanks for the invite um it was a pleasure to be with you and um as i said before we went on officially uh you know, we're going to be doing some of the same kind of things. So you'll be getting an invite to, to come back to, to share with us as well um, on our live stream in, in a couple of weeks. So uh, we appreciate the opportunity. 
uh, to partner and we look forward to what God is going to do in the South Hills, not only during the pandemic, but going forward. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.